Um, Mr. Bell, I, there's such a long way to, to go, but let's start with the news. I, I see in my evening standard this very evening a letter from M. Bell, and it's about the BBC, now, uh, uh, which is very, 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 very uh, right up to the moment. Um, you seem to, you seem to, you seem to be prepared to shed a few, be prepared to shed a few journalists from the BBC. That is, maybe it's overmanned, and maybe some sort of shake-up is necessary. Discuss. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a letter. They called me on the phone when I was on my way to Lancaster University yesterday afternoon to give them my thoughts. And I think you've got to be very careful if you've been in journalism as broadcasting. As I joined them in 1962, we all too easily talk of the good old days and the golden age. Uh, and all the time I've ever known the BBC, it has been in a state of crisis, flux, and revolution. Uh, and it still is. And morale is and every historically time, low. Uh, and if morale is low, the bosses are all to blame. And every time the, 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 the staff is to be cut, miraculously, there are new networks launched and new channels and more people are taken on. Uh, but I've, I start from the point of view that I think internal competition is only good up to a point. Uh, I remember, because I'm now an ambassador for UNICEF, they sent me to Sri Lanka after the tsunami. And there was not one, two, three, four, there were seven BBC television correspondents covering the same event. And on one night, Matt Fry and George Alagaya, two of the big hitters, was reporting from the same tiny village, uh, which has never been heard from before or since. Whereas Bill Neely, the excellent Bill Neely of ITV News, did it all by himself. And I, I was struck by how much competition there was between correspondents. And it I seems to me to be um, unnecessary. You describe it as there is a wastefulness about how the BBC runs its news operation. That's ah, well, it, okay. This, is, this has to do with the dread phenomenon of the sub-anchor. In the old days, there were newsreaders and reporters. The newsreader said, this is what we think is happening. The reporter said, well, he fleshed it out with pictures. But now you have the sub-anchor. It's a person in, immaculately dressed who stands between the original anchor and the, and the reporter and does nothing except look plausible. And I mean, you saw this. I mean, why did the BBC fly these people out to southern Portugal two months ago? Absolutely crazy. It's a, very, it's a very good question. And indeed, the, uh, in, your, in, your, in your phony letter, which has clearly misled the readers of yeah, the yeah. Evening Standard into, into thinking this was a, a self-generated piece of opinion, uh, you say that this decision shows how the news agenda has gone down market. Do you think it has? I, I don't think anybody, anybody disputes it. The, the, the McCann case, case is a classic. Um, the McCann story is a, whichever way you see it, is a family tragedy. It is neither more nor less. It has no, it casts no shadows, it has no resonance, it's not like the death of the 11-year-old boy in, in Liverpool which raised issues of gang culture and uh, gun culture. Um, I don't know if they put this in, and it actually was, it was like a letter because I'm not being paid for it, you see. <laughs> so it has the, it has the moral they've, they've authority They certainly the put it on the letter's page, that's for sure. <laughs> But it's, uh, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a funny old business. And, and, and the, the, the whole McCann thing was struck me as, 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 as completely bizarre, and I sounded off about it then. Uh, and you would expect, of course, everybody, I mean, the, the, the Sky News it does what Sky News does, but you actually expect better from the BBC. Okay, but there's a couple, before we pass on to your other many and wondrous achievements, two sort of fairly hard-nosed questions about your stance um, uh, on the BBC. First of all, are you really arguing that the loss, they claim the loss of 475 posts, but actually it's more than that because they, rather in a sl rather slippery way, there's 900 jobs going in the nations and regions. Quite a number of those will be journalists. So mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's not give them the benefit of the doubt and say probably 600 journalists in the UK coming out of the BBC. Are you seriously arguing that that, 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 that is, is a good and true way to tackle efficiency? <laughs> No, I think there, 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 there has been wastefulness, there is wastefulness, and in 2007 it's got to be dealt with. And I, I regret very deeply that some really good people are going to be let go. My, my, my worry about it is they're going to be let go from the, the, the young end of the profession rather than the rather than. No, I think it's much more likely to be, to be the reverse. Um, 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 uh, as you re after a second's thought, you'd have realized that, but I can actually give you the facts. 40% um, uh, of the editor class are going. 
30% of the assistant editor class and 20% of senior producers. The, the danger is, uh, which is great for young people, um, uh, but the danger is that a whole tranche of people with memory, knowledge and experience are being, are being taken out of that organization and more and more cock-ups will result. I, I, you don't seem to be too worried about that. I don't mind cock-ups. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I love cock-ups. I mean, I mean presentational cock-ups. I joined the BBC in, when the news came from Alexandra Palace. And the, and, and the graphics were magnetic boards and let children's letter sets. And the results were spectacular. And you might be interested to know the reason why Michael Aspel became as famous and successful as he was, because he was brilliant live covering up for cock-ups. Now, I have yeah, no problem with presentation of cock-ups. But, but, but Martin, I must pull you up a bit. We, we, we can all make jokes about cock-ups, and yes, we do indeed like them. And my favorite television of the, all the ages is Guy Goma's appearance mm. on News 24. If anyone saw that, it's a <laughs> truly <laughs> remarkable piece of television. Yeah. However, what is, what, what is appearing on, increasingly, is a result of ignorance. I mean, are you at all concerned that the, the capital of Ecuador is spelt on BBC K-W-E-T-O? I mean, do you think that's funny? I mean, yes, no. it is funny. But uh, do you, uh, two weeks ago, are you at all amused that uh, a former foreign minister of this country uh, was described as Sir Michael Rifkind? Now, now, nobody knew that he was actually called Malcolm. Now, when all the boring, highly paid, mm -hmm. middle-aged assistant mm -hmm. editors are taken out, do you think things are going to improve as a result of that? I think we have a problem across the media uh, with, uh, with a failure of, uh, of literacy, that kids come out of universities not knowing much about anything and not being able to, to, read, not know how to, spell to read or write Ecuador. or spell. That, 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 okay. that's a, but that's a, a problem for society rather than specifically to the BBC. Okay. Uh, let's move on to one of your favorite characters in all the world. Uh, the former Prime Minister of this country, Tony Blair. I know you're an enormous fan. Having read your excellent book, I know how much you like him and all of that. But um, here's the Telegraph headline from today. Tony Blair lifts hearts in New York speech. He gave the speech at uh, a charity dinner in New York. The only other British Prime Minister ever to have addressed this charity dinner was Winston Churchill by telephone in 1947. Um, but, and you'll be glad to know, I think you had to pay seven quid to get in here tonight. Real bargain. This would have cost 500 pounds to get in. But the slightly alarming thing is that referring to the ideology of Islamic extremism, Mr. Blair said, analogies, especially with the rise of fascism, can be misleading. But in pure chronology, I sometimes wonder if we're not in the 1920s, if not the 1930s, I fear. Quote, this ideology now has a state Iran, he added. What do you think of, what do you think of that uh, view of the world coming from a former British Prime Minister? And how much was he paid, by the way? Free. It was a Catholic charity. Okay. It's, it, it's, 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 he was trading in indulgences, no okay, doubt. Good. Uh, I'm probably the only person here who's ever actually been to this dinner. It was in honor of Al Smith, who I think was the first, first Roman Catholic to be a presidential candidate. And it's a, it's a big uh, money-raising occasion and very important for the Catholic Church. I, I say, and, 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 and don't misrepresent me here, boss, you'll say that clearly in the book I point out that Tony Blair is not the worst prime minister we ever had by any means. His, uh, his, his government had a, was helped engineer a miracle in Northern Ireland. It had a good record on the management of the economy. Its record in, on, on, on foreign aid, I think, was outstanding. But it made the worst mistake that any government, well, it was a personal mistake to him, uh, has made in our, in our lifetime. But one, and I've studied this in depth because, of course, this goes back to Kosovo and before that to, to, to Bosnia. And he made this, the, the Chicago speech in April 1999 while the Kosovo conflict was still going on. Uh, in which he already identified the next targets he had in mind for regime change, who were Milosevic and uh, Saddam Hussein. So it's not as if he's swept into this by the Americans. It was, it was his idea, and that's why, in that respect, I'm hard. And I've, I've written the obituary. Okay, it's a first obituary, but I'm pretty confident that other obituaries of his government are going to follow roughly the same judgment. Before, of course, I don't have opinions. Before, we go, back, before we go back to Iraq, let's, let's in the interests of uh, fairness, talk about Northern Ireland. I happen yeah. to be from that place. Do you really believe he made a difference there by his tenacity and continuing till they finally gave in, till he uh, wore them down? I don't think he was critical. Uh, I don't think he was the main man who did it. Um, but it happened on his watch. And when disasters happen on a prime minister's watch, he or she is blamed for them. Why not take some of the credit for the successes? I was a young reporter in the streets of Belfast, late 60s, early 70s. 
uh, Ian Paisley used to put his, uh, his, his heavy mob onto me. I had to escape from the window of a public lavatory in Lima Valley once to get away from these guys. A lot the, of people have to escape from the people who, pubs in Lima Valley, yeah, but never mind. The people who made this happen <laughs> were, of course, uh, Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness and, and Paisley, but the people of Northern Ireland. And if you go back to the peace women of, uh, of, of, of early 70s, I mean, they, they, were, they were very critical and crucial. Sure. And it, it is a miracle, but why not? I mean, since I'm blaming him for so much else, okay. why not give him a little bit of extra credit? All right, here? we'll give him a bit of credit, but let's get back to the blame. The blame's much more fun now. <laughs> You, in your book, in, in your book, you describe a wonderful um, uh, event. Martin, the novel, uh, the novelist Martin Amos, accompanying Blair on a farewell tour from Washington to Iraq, and uh, Blair at Basra hears all about the uh, about the hard and dark side of soldiering, the lives and limbs that were lost. And according to Amos, all the oxygen went out of him. It wasn't just that he seemed acutely underbriefed. He was quite unable to find weight of voice, to find decorum, the appropriate words for the appropriate mood. And according to you, and I'm sure you're right, these are the words he came out, out with our former prime minister. So we are killing more of them than they kill us. You're getting back out there after them. It's brilliant, actually. What do you think of that when you, when you wrote those words, or rather reproduced those words? <coughs> well, I, I added a conclusion of my own that instead of an answer, there was, a, there was only an an emptiness. Uh, one of the persistent themes in this book is that it describes the disaffection within the military about the task they were ordered to do. And it lays the blame in the end on something that has never happened in our country before, which is we have a whole generation of politicians. You can look at the front bench of the, of the present government. There's not a minister or junior minister who has ever worn the uniform or served in the armed forces. So they think that armed force can violence, organized violence, which is what warfare is, can deliver outcomes that it, that it can't. And I think that's fundamentally how we got into this mess. And um, for those who don't know, uh, that was uh, corporal. Uh, that was a, cor a was lance corporal or a corporal, full corporal? I rose to the act rank of acting sergeant, do you mind? <laughs> but I have, I have a lot of fun here with my I actually failed the officer selection test that Princes Harry and William passed so easily and unsurprisingly last year. <laughs> I failed it because I failed the intelligence test. <laughs> and I failed the Not once, but twice, then, according to your then book. I had to take it again, and I failed it again. <laughs> and I didn't mind until I saw the quality of the officers who passed. They, they were thick as two planks. Yeah. So then the battalion posted me to its intelligence section. <laughs> But they're the same people as the ones who are coming home, marching home from uh, Afghanistan. And we're going to have a wonderful parade for them in uh, Barry St. Edmunds on the 23rd. I'm both pro-peace and pro-soldier, and I, 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 I hope this comes out in the book. Just before we forget a, a little bit, it's more, it's, more, um, it's more Iraq than BBC, but your, your letter that never was starts off uh, that the BBC remains vital to our democracy. It stood up to the government of Iraq when no one else did and came out with its pre prestige enhanced. Um, Greg Dyke re resigning or being, or being sacked, the chairman resigning. What do you think of Alistair Campbell's role on all of this through a little bit of history now? That, the, the Dr. Kelly event. Looking back a bit, what do you think of that all? What does it say about our government, the state of our democracy, and indeed whether the BBC actually did stand up to government enough? I was elected 10 years ago on, on an issue of public trust in public life. Look back over all the things that have happened in the last 10 years, and let's, let's leave aside the scandals of involving quite senior ministers. Two things stick in my mind. One is the, uh, the, the House of Commons fired Elizabeth Filkin from the job of parliamentary commissioner for doing her job too well. And the other is the most disgraceful episode in public life in my lifetime, which was the naming and, and, and hounding to death of, uh, of, of Dr. David Kelly. So, you know, that's the, that's the background. Let, let's, let's break the two issues up. Uh, first, as I raised Kelly first, who do you hold responsible for the hounding to death of Dr. David Kelly? I hold, well, I've got to be careful because there may be lawyers in the audience, but the... the they the, won't, they won't the see you. They, they don't, they don't you know, see you on The this. Downing Street spin machine, without naming him, pointed certain journalists in the, in the direction. Uh, and, and, and the guy who was actually blamed for it was quite wrongly, in my view, was Andrew McKinley, who was one of the, one, was one of the genuine awkward squad in the House of Commons. But he gave, he gave, uh, he gave uh, David Kelly a hard time in that hearing, 
And what he was really, his anger was really directed at his own party and his own government, but he came over as being directed at, at David Kelly. Yes. And it was after that, I mean, that the David, and the next two days later, he was found Okay. Dead. It may have been slightly less of a conspiracy theory than you think, and, and I just happened to be a witness at one event that may have started this all off. Uh, Richard Sambrook, uh, mm -hmm. then head of BBC News, came in for, uh, to give a briefing, off the record briefing at the Times. I was present. He was asked by Times political reporters, is the person, is your suspect, have you been back to interview, re-interview him again? And he, Sam Brooks said, well, no, I, I can't really. And the, and the political editor said, is that because he's not in the country at the moment and has gone back? And Sam Brooks, and rather unwisely, but thinking he was off the record, said something like that. And, and from that very moment, the minute that lunchtime meeting ended, they were on the phones going through the lists putting names. Now, uh, they could only have got the name if they got help. But that may have, the BBC may have inadvertently started that, uh, that hair running. But it was a disgraceful episode in our public life. No question. No, no, no question. question. Elizabeth, Eliz um, uh, your friend Elizabeth, <coughs> what does she feel now? Why didn't she stand up? Why, do, why didn't she go public? Why didn't she allow herself to be quietly sacked? Because it wasn't an, 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 an obvious uh, sacking. Her, her term, she was appointed for three years, and the presumption was that she would be offered another three years. It was more like constructive dismissal. She yes. was invited to apply for her own job on the supposition that she wouldn't get it because a great whispering campaign had started against her. It all had to do with the, with the, the allegations against John Reid, who was then the Scottish Secretary. And I, I, I think it's very important for politicians, even amateurs like me, to say, well, you got it wrong. The biggest mistake I made was a, as an MP was not to resign from the Standards and Privileges Committee over that matter. Big mistake. Okay. Speaking as, uh, as, um, as an acting sergeant, sergeant retired, um, in, your, in, your, in your book, uh, you set out the conditions for the just war, which is something actually um, popes, bishops, archbishops have, have, have worried about all, you know, throughout history. But you say there are certain tests to be met. First, it must be unambiguously lawful and specifically authorized. Second, it must be proportionate. Third, in a democracy, it must be widely supported. And fourth, it must be doable. Now, that struck me all as entirely reasonable but very practical, lacking in a moral dimension. Would you like to add that moral dimension now? If you go on too much about the moral dimension, you, you, you end up supporting regime change in the countries where you think it should happen, and there's a very strong case to be made for that in Zimbabwe at the moment. But either we abide by the rules of international law, the United Nations, the Geneva Conventions, and all the rest, or else we just surrender to the law of the jungle. And, well, and, and one of the disasters of the last 10 years has been the, 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 the bypassing of, of the United Nations. The, the, the idea that we can impose our will on the world, or we'll, that we do it by parking our foreign policy up the, up the Potomac River. And, and I think we can, uh, there's, a, there's a whole chapter here about the politicization of the, uh, of the diplomatic service. And if I could just add, this is not really my book. It's a collective endeavor by me and a lot of other folks. Because when I was a young reporter covering various wars and conflicts in Northern Ireland and elsewhere, the young captains then are now the generals or the recently retired ex-generals. The, the third secretaries in far-flung embassies are now the ambassadors. So with the new technology, you shuffle chapters back and forth. Now, I can't identify them, but they are, this is their book as much as mine. The only one I can identify is, is my good friend Tam Deol, and the House of Commons has a Tam Deol-sized hole in it since he left. <laughs> I'm really intrigued. Let's go back to the beginning uh, for the moment, or nearly the beginning. Um, acting, uh, acting Sergeant Bell uh, then spent half a century, according to your words, in the unquiet places of the world, from Cyprus as a soldier in the 1950s right up almost to the present day. In a way, that doesn't happen by accident. It's a choice. Why have you spent 50 years in the unquiet places of the world? Well, I, I completed 50 years. I did other things at other times. But I joined the BBC, as I said, in 1962. By 1967, I was off doing my first war, which was actually Vietnam, uh, followed by the Six Days War. And after a while, I never intended this to happen. But if you, if you didn't get scooped 
and you didn't have a fight with a foreign editor. You sent it to be, you tended to be sent to, to other wars. You got a reputation as a safe pair of hands. So by the time I got back from the States in, I was the Matt Fry of my time, I would have you know. <laughs> and what really irritates me is that he did it better than I did it. He's better looking. And he did it in his second language. He's actually a German. Anyway, when I got back from the, uh, or got from back from the States, they sent me to cover the, the wonders of the new democracies in Eastern Europe in early, just after the fall of the Berlin War. And I did almost nothing but wars from then on, especially the, the Balkan Wars and Gulf War I and so on. So, so I became willy-nilly a war reporter without ever having intended to, just as I became an MP without ever having intended to. We'll talk about that in a minute, but, but uh, I'm intrigued by the war thing. Without, I can see, I know journalism is like that. You write one article, and you become the greatest leading world expert in the subject, and get asked to do that subject again. Um, uh, but but you could have got off. Oh you, no, I can. Could I can have, you could have got off the escalator no, can, and said, no, 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 I've had enough of, of all oh, no, these no, terrible no, things. No, 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 there's another dimension here that there's no reason you should understand. Um, a little while ago, I was uh, I spent some time with the support company of Three Para, who are wonderful people who were the first ones through Hellman uh, a, a year and a half ago, and uh, and and I asked their officer commanding um, why they they're going back in six months you know why why they they seem to en enjoy it so much first of all he said it's what we're trained for and then he said it's as far away from the Ministry of Defense as it's possible to be <laughs> <laughs> so if you were doing war zones you were as far away from the BBC's uh, bureaucracy or anybody's bureaucracy and the whole thing fell apart when the first mobile phone arrived on the first front line and you'd be woken up in the morning by somebody telling you what the feeling of the, of the meeting had been and would you please be more careful in future. That's what, th this, this is when it all went pear-shaped. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, They know, they know. You've got it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, at least you were appreciated a bit at the BBC. Uh, my former colleague Stuart Dolby at the Financial Times where I spent most of my working life uh, was known as Small Wars Correspondent and the <laughs> FT only has one Small Wars Correspondent and the Small Wars are not very high up in the editorial priorities and he was once came back from the Congo where he was shot at and nearly killed. Came all the way back to Brackenhuis, went up the marble staircase, saw uh, Freddie Fisher, the slightly Germanic editor, who looked at him and said, well, that wasn't about very much, was it? <laughs> <laughs> so so at, least, at least you got herograms at the BBC, presumably. No, I, I, was, I started off as a small bank robberies correspondent. Because <laughs> in, in, in television, as we don't know, there's a phenomenon called the Bigfoot. And, the, well, I suppose John Simpson is the preeminent Bigfoot of our time. But there are a lot of little feet underneath, and you hope that eventually you will become a Bigfoot yourself. And, and that's, well, that's how it's, I mustn't, I mustn't go down that road, but I, I won't go down no, that no, road. Please, I, no, no, please, I, no, I positively fine. encourage you to do so. No, no. <laughs> what, were the, what, were the what, what, what were the stories uh, you most remember for doing them well, the most horror, the most, the memories, lying in bed at night, what are the stories you would, that would go through your mind before you went to sleep? No. I don't have nightmares about war zones. I have nightmares about Neil and Christine Hamilton, especially Christine. <laughs> and I have nightmares about sitting in a studio and drying up without, without an autocue or a script. That's what I have nightmares about. Yes, so there have been some famous examples, but, uh, others, not you, uh, 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 of that. Okay, that would seem to be an appropriate moment to ask why a perfectly uh, respectable BBC war correspondent should suddenly decide to stand against Neil Hamilton for Parliament. A very strange thing to do. Why did you do it? Again, you didn't have to. Well, they never told me about Christine, for a start. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I'd, I'd finished with Bosnia. I just completed a, a, a documentary about Kofi Annan's first three months as UN Secretary General. Um, and I've, um, my friend, I, I was out of favor with John Burt, to be quite honest. In fact, I, I was never in favor with John Burt. Uh, and How did that manifest itself? Well, because in anybody in, in television news, I mean, Obviously, I didn't have the advantage of being good-looking, which is important now. Sandy Gall you and didn't I, drink fizzy water all the time, either. No, I didn't, certainly not. But Sandy Gall and I, a of ITM, were once described by one of the television critics as having faces like the relief maps of the countries we were covering. <laughs> <laughs> which, in his case, was Afghanistan, and mine was Bosnia. <laughs> and suddenly there was this vote for younger and better-looking people. I, I worked out I'd done 11 days' work in seven months. So when... And actually, I missed an opportunity to be Kofi Annan's spokesman because my phone rang 
when I was lost in the snows of Serbia and I, I got the message too late. And a former S colleague in the Financial Times got the job and went from strength to strength, you know? No, that was a, a guy called Fred Eckhart, actually, but they, oh, did, they, did, they, did, similar, they did similar things. Uh, and so when I, I got a call out of the, I, I didn't intend to be an MP. I'd been opening an exhibition of photographs by Tom Stollard, who's the, who's the, the, the partner of Kate Hoey who did some remarkable Bosnian war photographs. This was in the South Bank. We had, we had um, I don't know, in the people's whatever it is afterwards, and Kate, because they were looking for someone uh, to take on Neil. And they'd already tried uh, Terry Waite, who actually comes from the Tatton constituency, and was the obvious man. And Terry turned it down on the excellent grounds. He'd already served one four-year hostage, uh, four years a hostage, <laughs> didn't want to serve another. But I did it because all the regrets of my life, every single one, have not been about the things I have done. There, of course, there have been a few of those, but the things I haven't. You know, the challenge, I would have kicked myself, you know, could you have made a difference? And I'm not going to, I mean, I can't claim I was the greatest MP ever, but I got a dodgy guy out of politics. And, and, and the, the people were just fantastic. It was a people's insurrection. As one of, I mean, there was nothing to do with a candidate, as one of my helpers and supporters said, against Neil Hamilton, a trained monkey would have won. <laughs> It's not here, is it? No. Before asking about your time in Parliament, what do you think? What do you think of the Hamilton's subsequent career once you removed their political one? Well, I think they're entitled to earn a living in in, in any way they wish. Uh, I wouldn't personally wish to do it by appearing in fishnet types at the, the opening of the Manchester Erotica exhibition, but that's their choice. <laughs> and, and she's never been more than the, than, than, than the loyal wife throughout. So, Matt have you been have you been approached to go on sort of celebrity Love Island or any of the sort of <laughs> uh, things that the Hamiltons do? I uh, two years ago I turned down um, Celebrity Big Brother, and having seen what George Galloway did, I think it's very wise. <laughs> and only a few months ago, I you went you know you don't have to believe this, but it's true. I turned down Celebrity Come Dancing. That's Strictly Come Dancing. Strictly Come Dancing. But that could have made, that could have given you a new career. A new, and the, uh, things would um, have gone off in a really quite important direction after that. I thought I didn't want to launch a serious book and face that kind of public humiliation, to be quite honest. <laughs> serious for a moment. Um, how do you, what did you make of the House of Commons as an independent? Could one voice make any difference at all in those circumstances? I think an independent voice is probably heard more than that of an obscure backbencher of a mainstream political party. But I, I won't hide from you, it was the, probably the most shocking four years of my life. I was not ready for the willingness of MPs to vote against their consciences. Uh, over and over and over again, and I didn't understand till I saw it, the, the power and influence of the whips, uh, and, and the, 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 the commonplace acts of disgrace. I, I, you said I, I didn't live on barley water, but I used to watch the football in Annie's bar. And I saw a bloke drink himself to death in Annie's bar, and the whips didn't care, so long as he was sober enough to drag himself upstairs. On another occasion, I saw a quite senior MP with a reputation for integrity exchange his vote for a peerage. I know he did it, he knows he did it, and I can't name him because I don't want to spend the next four years in the courts of law. But these are the kind of things that routinely happened, and I wasn't ready for it at all. Okay. The, the implication from reading your book is that you clearly, if not disapprove of the party system, then certainly disapprove of the whipped party system. Uh, what's your alternative? I mean, free vote of no, all no, MPs? No, 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 no. Uh, you know? the, the last time there was a, a parliament of independence, more or less, was the 18th century, and it was the most corrupt in our history. But we have to have a system in which the, the parties allow a, a certain amount of freedom of conscience to their own MPs. Otherwise, the whole, and you've seen, you've seen it especially in this, uh, I think the, the, the vote on Iraq, 18th of March 2003, was totally disgraceful. Especially, I think, on the conservative side. The opposition is there to, to scrutinize, to challenge. And there'd been a dodgy dossier only six months before. Were they hoodwinked by Alistair Campbell? So these, I mean, these things really matter. Um, uh, I think it's helpful to have the Parliament to have one or two independents. It's got two, the vulnerable members for Wire Forest and, uh, and Blind Eye Gwent. Uh, I, 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 I can't claim to have really understood all the, 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 the rituals and so on, but I, but I did my best. And I've, I've done a, I included here actually, forgive me, a little requiem for political parties. 
Uh, what I want is a composer to put it to music for me. It goes like this. There might even be one here. Yeah. I'd rather be an independent-minded composer. It goes like this. Um, indifferent to the people's warning, the party's headed for a fall. Tory, Labour and Lib Dem. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will, of course, remember them, but miss them not at all. It's quite short, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it will indeed be a short music, uh, musical performance. Oh, well, can, I, can I please add my, my, my epitaph for Tony Blair? Uh, here lies the fame of Tony Blair, who sent his soldiers everywhere. His exercise of power was regal. The war, however, was illegal. <laughs> Okay, I'm no Kipling, but I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I mean, I can see why you're intrigued. I can see why you um, you tried to win your seat back. But having lost it, I mean, it's almost a glutton of punishment for punishment to go and try and get another one, wasn't it? Uh, I, did try, I did try and it was It was so odd a situation. It involved the penile Pentecostal church. And even now I won't talk about it publicly much because... The church has uh, has good lawyers, but there was a lot of deep dissatisfaction uh, in the Brentwood Monger constituency. And uh, actually, I I think I did. I, I had to take on all three parties, and yes. I was only two and a half thousand votes short of winning. Uh, which okay. from a standing start, because if you're an independent, you have to win every single vote. You inherit nothing. In three weeks campaign, we I ended up at thirteen and a half thousand votes, which wasn't bad. So I'm quite proud of that. Yeah, not bad at all. What um, you, um, you, you you quote with eyebrows raised, at least uh, subsequently, uh, Tony Blair's comment in 1997, a sense of hope beyond all imagining. Oh, yeah. Um, is there any, have you any more hope, or hope that that sort of hope will be restored with uh, Mr. Brown? And, it such a, such, and it was true. We had in May 1997 a sense of hope beyond ordinary imagining. And they, I don't know, I still don't understand why they did it. They, 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 they were all elected. I was elected on an issue of public trust in public life. And they then sort of let it go as if it were a fashion accessory no longer wanted on voyage. Well, I think after all we've been through, after Castro periods, especially after the, after the Iraq war, uh, I sense the pendulum um, swinging again. I was very encouraged by Gordon Brown's start, though I have to say I was very dismayed when he looked the camera in the eye and said that the opinion polls had nothing to do with his decision not to call a jet. Why, why do they do that? Are you, are you, are you, are you, you know, don't tell me you're sceptical about that remark, are you? No, 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 what I'm saying is that there has to, I mean, how can we trust them if they, if they, if they, if they so obviously say that things are so which are not so? Des Brown was a nice man. I interviewed him at the fringe of the uh, Labour Party conference. His first trip to Baghdad on becoming Defence Secretary, it happened by chance to be an unusually dreadful day, even by Iraq standards. There was a suicide bomb about the Interior Ministry uh, outside the end. There were nine American soldiers killed and so on and so on and so on. And he looks the camera in the eye and says the security situation is improving and our only challenge is to maintain that improvement. Well, why do they do it? You're the politician. No, no, I'm also the ex-journalist. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put another challenging notion to you. But on this matter of, of, of cash for peerages, everybody knows the exchange goes on. I've written a whole chapter on the way it was presented because, all right, politicians do what they do. But when what they do is so obviously dodgy, who are these journalists who come to their defense and say things like, well, okay, it may have been corrupt, but it's only a, it's a British corruption. We can almost be proud of it. It's only a minor corruption. I mean, they're only going to be dressed in ermine robes. Well, sod that. They're going, to, they're, going to, they're going to sit in the High Court of Parliament and the National Assembly. And something that, that really struck me, and I, I, I don't know if any of them are here, but those who chiefly defended the government and wrote pieces in, in, with headlines like, Kindly Leave the Stage, Mr. Plod, they all came from the same uh, journalistic background, which is the BBC's political and parliamentary office on Four Millbank. John Rentoul, Steve Richards, David Aronovich. They all did. What is it? There's something proud like Don't tell them. No, tell them. There's something proud like about that place, which I don't understand. Hmm. You see why the BBC kept me beyond the rim of the civilized world for all those years. <laughs> Before we pass from the field of politics, um, be, be so kind as to tell the audience um, or elaborate what the Nutsfield Guardian principle oh. of politics is. I'm sure people will find it enlightening. I mean, every every MP has an has 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 his local uh, has his local weekly paper. 
my, my, I'll get this right in the end. I never, I'm not good at microphones, you know. Never, never used them before. Um, I, I, this was a question of, of common sense. And I think survival in politics as an MP is mostly a matter of common sense. It is, for instance, being careful how you fill out your mortgage application. <laughs> These are examples entirely at random. <laughs> it is not taking a £373,000 loan from a, from a wealthy man whose business affairs your department happens to be investigating. It's perhaps declining to go badger hunting in a lay-by off the M4. <laughs> uh, and and, and the, 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 Guardian, man, the Nutsford Guardian principle goes like this. Whatever you do as an MP or public figure of any sort, whatever speech you make, however you, you vote, even where you take your holidays, um, how's it going to look on the front page of your local weekly paper? If it looks all right, you've got no problem. If it doesn't, then you've got a problem. And, and, and the classic, and the second tranche of the Nutsford Guardian principle is when you do make a mistake, or if you've got something to hide, you get it all out right now, or you'll die the death by a thousand cuts. The classic example of this was Paddy Ashdown's famous affair, held a press conference, Jane by his side, and he said everything, and he told me he was on his, on his way out, and the bus driver saw him, a thumbs up, you know. Uh, you know, Paddy, Paddy come through. But time and time again, they, they hide it. It's the, it's the, it's the Watergate thing, and that, that's, the, that's the nuts for Guardian principle. Good. Perhaps one of the most arresting sentences in your book, for me, was the following. Tom Bauer is the rudest man in England. To be fair, he says the same of me. The difference is that I mean it and he doesn't. <laughs> could, you, could you please, there's a, there's a wealth and depth of meaning in that sentence. That, 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 could, could you elaborate? Well, it, 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 well it, it, the last time I was here, actually, Tom gave a brilliant presentation during the Conrad Black uh, trial. Of, of, of how things were going. And I, I did ask, because I'm interested in Tom, cause, and I said, how is it he can only write about somebody he thoroughly dislikes? Uh, but, but that's, who we, and, and he's all, I was telling him he's the rudest man I ever met, because actually once in, in, in Washington, he was a panorama producer, and I, I'd worked on my contacts with CBS, who were next to us, for three years. I, I schmoozed them, I got tape out of them, and all the good work I'd done in three years was demolished in 30 minutes by Tom, who shouted at them. But it really comes from a, a famous story of, 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 from Sandhurst, where the, where, the, where, the, where, the, where, where the sergeant major says that, uh, I call you sir, and you call me sir. The difference is that I mean it and you don't. <laughs> so it has that background. There's okay. a lot of military stuff in here. Give us a swift download on what you think of the current fads and trends in journalism, uh, uh, blogs, user-generated content, the BBC, if you will, uh, chasing the viewer and listener through every goddamn piece of technological equipment known to man. Is there any good in it? Um, there might be. I don't know enough about it to say there's any bad in it. Um, I mean, I, I, myself, I would actually prefer to work at Frank Frankly in the days of the cleft stick. But there was... I said there wasn't a golden age. Actually, there was. There was a time when film. I started in film, black and white film. It was very cumbersome, and it had to be. It had to be. It had to be spliced together, often with sellotape. And then, miraculously, in the early 80s, we had these handheld cameras, and we had the editing machines. And suddenly, the editing process and the decision making of what pictures you used and what you said were moved away from the television center or Gray's Inn Road and out in the field to Afghanistan or Bosnia. And we guys, we had the most amazing freedom. And he took the bastards about 10 years to catch up with us. <laughs> and, and one of the reasons there is now the emphasis on, on rooftop journalism, you know, you, somebody standing in front of the two most famous palm trees in the world inside the fortified zone. I mean, one of the reasons is it's too dangerous for people to go out. And therefore, and I understand that, I'd be too scared to go out now after what happened to Alan Johnson. Uh, and, and, um, and, and many others, but, but another is it gives, it gives London more, more control. This, this started happening in the early 90s. Uh, I would do the best I could with the best pictures available in Bosnia, and then you had to stand in the television station and say it again without pictures. Okay. Let's do just a quick uh, technology check. Uh, you have digital television at home? I've got five channels. Is that digital television? No. Okay. <laughs> do you have a personal video recorder? I, d I have, but it's broken. Uh, do you have high-definition television? No. Have you got a video iPod? A what? A video... 
Why certainly not. not. <laughs> so, certainly not. Do you routinely download television onto your computer via broadband? I've got no idea how to do that. Okay, enough, enough. Right, let's finish. Let's, uh, I, I won't torment you any further. I think the point has I'm been not made. not tormenting me. <laughs> uh, let's just finish this bit of it and bring in the audience. But before, I just want to quote, I want to quote from your book. If the new labor years have taught us anything, it is that experience is a better guide than instinct, that faith-based policymaking is a recipe for disaster, that the denial of evident truth is an offense against democracy, and that we cannot afford a future like our past. Are you at all optimistic that you will get what you want? I think things are, things are going the right way. I cannot conceive of a British government of this color or the other color or any color ever again in our lifetime parking its foreign policy so unconditionally up the Potomac River. They're just not going to do it. Or ignoring the, 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 the wishes of a million people who, who march in the streets. There's a sense of guilt about this. And, and, and I end up with a, I put the case for, for, for penitence and repentance, which is there in all the Abrahamic faiths. And I, I asked, did any politician ever get it so terribly wrong and apologize? And this, somebody did. It was Robert, Robert McNamara, the Donald Rumsfeld of his time, uh, the architect of the Vietnam War. Uh, Tony Blair hasn't yet begun to see his way to that, but you, you live in hope. Especially if he goes on attending Catholic dinners, you never know idea where it will end. <laughs> will the confession be in private or public then? Uh, can we bring anybody else in? Say who you are and there's a microphone and give him a harder time than I've done. Yeah, here you are. Third row. Just say who you are so we know you're prejudiced or background. Oh, extremely prejudiced. I, I'm, I'm Anthony Massey. I'm a BBC producer. I had the pleasure of working with, with Martin over the years. Uh, we would immediately agree on all the things we don't like about broadcast news as it is currently configured. And I absolutely agree with you that uh, mobile phones were the end of it. Every now and again, Kate Haley and I give thanks over dinner that we did Boston. There was no mobile phones, so nobody could tell us yeah. what to think or where to go or what to do. Um, and I agree with you about rooftop journalism and all that's followed. What, however, do you find admirable about television news specifically as it is currently practiced? I think there are some wonderful people. Um, I think they're probably person for person uh, more gifted than we are. We were. They, they, they certainly have to, to think faster. One of the problems that has happened is that, that, that people are driven back on their rooftops, not only by, by, by the insecurity, but by the fact they've got to file four or five times a, times a day. And this, this, this lends to the inauthenticity. But, you know, but, but Matt Fry writes better than I wrote, and I hate him for it. <laughs> um, Bill Neely is a, is a brilliant reporter. I, um, I like um, uh, Mad Adam on Sky. I mean, they're all got, there are some terrific people out there. And they, they probably do understand the technology better, and you're absolutely right. But I think, it was a, I think it's possible still to be a journalist and locked technologically in the, in, in the dark ages because the technology is a, is, a, is a wonderful servant, but a poor master. The person who said, here, here, should have the microphone and explain. <laughs> uh, uh, identify him immediately. Well, um, my name is Chris Wanga. I was just a sound technician, and I worked a lot of time in news, current affairs, and documentaries over the past 40 years, and covered some of the areas that uh, you, you may not have been, but other journalists had to do. Uh, even forgotten where I, where I yes, started. The, uh, I think the problem, the advantage that we had is that, 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 that um, uh, our stuff was not going out tomorrow or even today by, by, um, by a mobile phone and therefore we were less, much less dangerous to the individuals we may or may not have been filming. And because then, you know, you had to get to a place where you could uh, have somebody ship the film, you then had to get it to London, it was two days in the labs and then it was a week or so, or two or three days or an hour. Uh, a day at the most before they could even have it edited into a news piece, so we were uh, much less threatening. And I think in that context, it is infinitely more dangerous for, 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 for those who are doing it today. That is true. We are now threatened because we are threatening, because it can be so uh, influential. Uh, and I forgot to add one name to my list of modern heroes, because he's sitting quietly in the back. His name is Vaughan Smith, and he happens to be our, the boss here, and he runs this place. Uh, and I thought he'd finished with it all, but three weeks ago on, on Newsnight, he came up with a fantastic uh, video report 
uh, with his old regiment, the Grenadier Guards, and mine, the Royal Anglians. And it was and one of the great things about it was there was not a single reporter to be seen anywhere. There was not a single word of spoken reportage. Uh, and I think that's probably the, probably the wave of the future. But if anybody wants to know about embedding, embedding is as good or as bad as the journalists who are embedded. In the case of the boss here, the first class. But he's not going to get away as light as that. Microphone, please, to explain well, what, explain what you did and why. And why no reporter? I mean, for goodness sake, this, well, this could be serious work. redundancies if people like you catch on. Well, I, 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 my background is as a news cameraman, so um, I've uh, obviously filmed a lot of reporters, and I just wondered whether they were entirely required. <laughs> <laughs> now, seriously, tell us about, for those who didn't see the piece, what did you try and achieve? Um, well, I've been spent, I spent 20 years trying to um, film my old regiments on operations and uh, uh, failed uh, until fairly recently when I thought I'd pass it. Um, I managed to get an embed by hook or crook, um, and it, I, I, I did a blog online, um, so I, 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 I perhaps understand more about um, iPods than, than Martin does, um, and um, was able to uh, um, uh, try this. But I, I didn't get too many people on my blog, um, and I, I, had to, I funded it myself. I'm an, I'm an independent. Um, <laughs> rather well, like Martin's uh, political career, my journalist career of being independent. Uh, and um, I, 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 I flogged it to Newsnight, who took it to my surprise. Um, but it was all filmed within 18 hours. Um, and um, I got the soldiers to actually, um, uh, to, I, I showed them the video and said, look, what's going on here, what's going on here, what's going on here. And then I used their voices to explain the story rather than okay. my own. Martin, have another go at um Embeds is, um, is a huge divide um, between people who, maybe it's too dangerous now, who rampage in a freelance way mm. behind war zones and those who are necessarily constrained, or don't you agree, by being embedded. Does it add, what does it add and what are the constraints in your experience? Um, I, I face both ways on this. Uh, I think to, I, the, the fate of uh, Terry Lloyd of ITN in 2003 was a dreadful lesson to us all on the difficulty of roaming free uh, and unembedded in, uh, in, a, in a no man's land. I see nothing wrong with uh, journalists who've got no military experience, and none of them have except people like, um, like, like Vaughan and... Uh, and, uh, and yourself. Well, you know, and, and, and Anthony Lloyd. I mean, Anthony Lloyd is the most... I mean, goodness knows what he was like as an officer in the Green Jackets, which is incredibly scruffy now. <laughs> but, he can, but he draws on his experience to do more distinguished reporting. Uh, on the other hand, what, what frightens me about it is there's, there's, and this is one of the great things that you see, there was, because there was no reporter, there was none of this gung-ho quality, this phony excitement. There was a dreadful scene early in, in about the first week of the Iraq war in which uh, uh, an international news channel had a bloke coming on, uh, dressing the camera as the tank rolled through the desert, saying this is historical journalism, this is historical television. It wasn't historical, it was, it was hysterical, and it absolutely added nothing. So, uh, you also got to factor in that there are now so many more satellite networks and journalists and, and media people. 2003 in March, there were 2,500 of them kicking their heels in Kuwait, Kuwait City, unable to get anywhere. Now, are they all going to turn up on the, on the field of play, and is the are the military going to have to save them? Uh, partly it's done by the, by, the, by the military to not to be deflected what, what they have in mind. Uh, and if it's done well, it's done well. If it's done badly, it's, it, it, it's a disgrace to journalism. Okay. Can I have the microphone right to the front, please, uh, where David Sells is minding his own business, but is not being allowed to do so any longer. I any longer. David uh, wants to speak uh, up for a pause. Uh, David, I just want your memories of this, this guy in the field. Uh, did, did, did you lob any decent shells at him in your experience? <laughs> you mean the time that I was with the Serbs? Uh, the tell, tell the story from the start. <laughs> the <laughs> and his nibs here was being shot with a bit of shrapnel in his gut, I seem to remember. And it was, yeah. your, it was your boys that did it, yeah? yeah well, I told, I told them, but I spoke to them too late. I said, <laughs> not him. He's, he's a good not. guy. No, he's on camera, too. I mean, Martin's always done these things on camera. So, uh, no, I haven't, I haven't uh, I'm, I'm a bit cooler than his nibs here about the need for reporting, even in this present age. How's, how do you mean, cool, about the need for reporting? Well, um, I mean, I think that the good reporter, you mentioned Matt Fry, for example, a good reporter 
uh, is still essential because you get a point of view, you get a balance, you get singling out things which are um, important at the moment, and I think that is that is essential. When you see bad reporting, you just think, oh my God, here we go again. So the BBC has its its <laughs> ups and downs, <laughs> as we know, and I I was one of the two thousand who was hooked out last year. But um, no, I mean I've I've always sort of you know followed Martin in different different places and. Um, being a great respecter of, of what he does, and I think he's been a bit cool about these things at the, at the moment. But uh, reporting is, I think, uh, essential. And um, as in terms of witness, or in terms of analysis, or both. Well, in in terms of, of both, um, I think you know you can occasionally be <coughs> a bit naughty about uh, the, the way you do things, and. Um, Occasion, oh yes! <laughs> oh, oh, oh yes! 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 Please! You you got you 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 gave you gave the blue Peter cat a phony name, right? <laughs> I called it Tiddles. <laughs> the real name was Pussy, by the way. They tried to cover that up. It was the naughty kids who wanted it called Pussy, and that's why they changed the name. Yes, it took for different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> that was done. No, I just. Um, I think there is still an important role for the reporter, to be honest. Um, what you also have, what you need for quality is, again, if you're doing television, you need a good cameraman or woman. You also need a sound recordist, and they've almost vanished in news now. And what you sacrifice when you throw these things away is quality. And there's no two ways about it. You can't improve quality by having one man or woman doing both the sound, the lighting, and the... Uh, filming um, on, on, on camera. It just, it just, there are people who do, still do it extremely well, but you obviously lose, you know, I, it happened to me once and uh, there was no sound. Uh, it had just been, and because you couldn't expect the camera, but was concentrating on, on all the other stuff. Okay. <laughs> Very briefly, as I've got you and um, merciless in these things, um, what do you think will happen when they put together radio, television, and online news and take out 500 posts. What do you think the effect is that going to be? An increase in quality, as the management say? I don't think I should have talked to you before this meeting. <laughs> no, I, I, I exploit I, all I, conversations. No, no, I'm a journalist, for Christ's sake. What you lose, in every, and I, I did say this to you earlier, what you lose is what we've had over the years, Martin and I, in a similar sort of period, is <clears throat> you have little teams. And little teams are gathered together in bulletins and pro I'm talking about the BBC essentially, programs and bulletins. And you work as a little team. And the teams change, you work with different people at different times. But <clears throat> that is, in, particularly if you're abroad in a war or something like that, that is a, that's a driving force, <clears throat> that little team. And if you start throwing those teams away and mixing everybody into one big pot, um, I'm afraid you're going to lose an, an, an element there. First of all, programs are going to lose an identity. I worked for many years for Newsnight, and uh, you know, whether you like it or not, it has an identity. And if you diminish things like that, you take away identities, and um, you know, that would be, I'm afraid, uh, a very considerable loss uh, if it happens, the way they're pushing it at the moment. Martin Bell, you talked earlier, right at the beginning, of wastefulness, but isn't part of the wastefulness, isn't that the space with, with, within which distinctiveness and creativity actually flourishes? Some of it, not all. Some of it, yes. There, there's going to be a degree of waste. There are going to be stories you, you, you embark on and they, they don't turn out and, 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 and you decide to, uh, to abandon them. I don't think there's, there is uh, much excuse for having three or four reporters from the same organization trying to falling over each other to report the same story, that's okay. all. Yeah, there are several people. I'm going to come back to you, sir, in a moment. But the, there's a woman in, the, woman in the back row there, or nearly the back. Yep. Yeah, first. Yeah. No, that's not just any old woman. This is my former producer. <laughs> <laughs> ah, hey, the, the, se the, se the secret's at last. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just, I was going to say, I, ha I was glad to hear you right early on defending youth. Um, in this business because I think when, when I first worked with Martin and he came to ITN and everyone said Martin Bell doesn't do producers I was like oh god 
And then he walked in and he said, hello, darling. And I thought, oh, okay, I think it's going to be fun. But actually, I think the point I'm trying to make here is that the, we've always sort of done youth versus experience. It's almost like you, we make a battle. There's some sort of battle line drawn between if you're young, you're not experienced. So that means you can't be good. Somewhere in the middle of all of this, when we talk about BBC job cuts and we talk about losing the experience, we have to square that circle. We have to embrace the young people who maybe haven't been in as many war zones as yourself, but who can still bring something to the party. So how do we do that? You're, you're an ambassador for this. You and I work together brilliantly. So at what point do we say to people, forget those battle lines, forget those attempts to put a distance between us, how do we bring us back together again? Well, we, we're all in the same business together. I mean, any organization needs, needs, this, needs the fresh eye, uh, the enthusiasm, um, the knowledge of the technology. The reason I embraced you is not only because you're charming, because I didn't know how to get the stuff out of the computer by myself. <laughs> <laughs> but also, be, be sort of old heads who've been there before, and maybe I won't have had the experience tells you something. I mean, and, and, and you wouldn't believe it, but I was young once too. In fact, I. I, I nearly lost my job when I, in about 1966 because I was told by the editor that I looked too young to be believable. <laughs> Some problems solve themselves. <laughs> yeah, I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll come, come forward. When... Hi, my name is Ishmael Blade Road, uh, Rice and Peace Films, an independent production company um, produced the stuff uh, before Christ Bible and Big Factories and stuff, which was aimed to take it out. Anthony Lloyd a few days before he got blown up in Sierra Leone. <laughs> But um, the, the, the point I'd like to sort of raise is, is what's your opinion and take in terms of the way that the, the mainstream news have actually reported the war in Iraq? Because previously the, the mainstream media, were, in the BBC in particular, were also cheerleaders of this war. And all of a sudden now that there's been a turn in, uh, in, the, in the tide, uh, they've now become um, anti-war advocates, if you like. What's your take in terms of how the war in Iraq, the, the, the episode of, of Lebanon, uh, last year, how, what's your take in terms of how that's being reported to the public by the BBC? Uh, I thought the reporting of the war in Lebanon was, was in many places, in most cases, quite distinguished on, on, on both sides, actually. There was some, there was some good reporting. I, I'm not saying I'd, I'd say the same of the, of the war in Iraq. For the first three weeks of the hot war, you, you hardly heard from an Iraqi. It is the nature of, of embedded journalism that you're with the soldiers and you stay with the soldiers and you and you're, the only Iraqis you saw were, were Iraqi soldiers who'd been or Iraqi surrenders and, and, and distant, distant shots of cowering villagers. Um, I don't think it got any better. Um, I think the, the coverage was fairly disgraceful from, from start to finish. But I would give, give credit to those who were not embedded and at risk to themselves and they didn't all survive. They stayed in Baghdad. One of the, believe me, one of the scariest things in, in, in war journalism is to have the war coming at you. Uh, and, and I think a particular mention must be made here of Al Jazeera, which has suffered disproportionately. Uh, not accidentally, I'm convinced. Uh, they lost, they, they had their bureau in, in Kabul uh, targeted in 2001. Uh, they lost a man in, 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 in Baghdad. Um, they're, they're, the, the, the Americans have been after them, I've, I've no doubt about that. And, and whatever you think about journalists, we're not actually um, combatants. Uh, and the idea of journalists as sort of running with the enemy is, is appalling. Uh, so I don't think, with, with these exceptions, and, and some more, I don't think we've got uh, too much to be proud about. I mean, I would have liked to have been here on, on Wednesday night when John Simpson was giving his presentation. John struck me as a bit of a cheerleader for the war and the new democracy early on, but I, I think he's changed his mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but then I want this man up front who's been waiting a long time. Finish, finish this comment, yeah. Yeah. and then we'll no, come back to you. I'm very intrigued about your comment about the, the, the possible deliberate selection for the termination of some of the uh, uh, journalists that were covering certain American events. But look, I'm, I have friends who, who work in, in Italy, in film game, and in Spain uh, as well. A few, there's a few um, um, Arab friends left over from working in, the, in, in, in Israel in the occupied territories and so on. There's no question they are entirely in, uh, in Iraq that uh, the, uh, of the 15, or I think 17 journalists that were taken out in the first few days, that almost all of those were targeted mm. by American special forces. What is your view of that? Uh, I think there was one um, embedded journalist uh, who was killed. Yeah, 
one ground he went his uh, his Humvee turned over I mean I mean um, accidents are going to going to happen in a in a in a in a war zone. But yeah, the, the, the if you're if you if you want to survive in a in a war zone in a hot war, high intensity war, shock and awe, um, the only way to survive is to is is to be embedded. And therefore to some extent to be bent to the will of the of the governments doing the embedding. It's it's impossible to avoid. But if then the choice is either being embedded or not covering the war at all, then obviously you, you go embedded. Would I? I, I, went, I was embedded with the Queen's Royal Irish Hussars in 1991. Uh, no, I, I've, but you see, the difference is that it used to be what, what Rupert Smith calls a war among the people, which was reported from among the people. And we can't do it anymore. So what you're seeing on television news is very fragmentary, uh, and it's inauthentic, and it makes it easier for governments to get away with the sort of nonsense we've seen in these last years. Okay. Be waiting a long time. My name is uh, Musa Karam. I'm a translator from Gaza. Uh, Mr. Dowd, why do you think there are bigger numbers of journalists being killed in war zones? I well, why are there more journalists being killed in war zones? I think, first of all, uh, there are the weaponry for all the talk of, uh, of, of precision bombing is, is more indiscriminate. The wars are not, and, and again, I would refer you to General Sir Rupert Book's uh, Smith's seminal book, uh, The Utility of Force. He points out that almost always now, wars are not fought between massed formations of, 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 of uh, armor and aircraft and, and ships and so on. They're fought uh, among the people. And the, 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 in, in Iraq, the, 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 the opposition to the Americans and the British then fade in among the people. And the casualties among the people. I mean, I, I know that the posh professional military historians dispute this, but I think it's beyond dispute that at the time of the Great War, the casualties were predominantly huge, huge killing, worst in the British military history, but on the whole about 10% civilian and 90% military. What have we done in the eight years since then? We've, uh, we've changed the proportions. So there now, and this is true to my experience in, uh, in Bosnia, in, in Croatia, uh, in Iraq, they're 90% civilian. Uh, and this should change our attitude to war. Uh, and this is one of the points I've been trying to, trying to make, that we've gone AWOL from our history. We don't understand the pity and horror of war. We've the, the last of our World War II veterans is now about 83. That's the very youngest. Um, and don't take it from me. Take it from Baroness Helena Kennedy, a wonderful lady who was, who was a labor peeress who didn't have to buy her title. Uh, I went to a great lecture she gave a year and a half ago in which she described the extent to which the government has gone AWOL from our history, and she described Dan 10 Downing Street as a history-free zone. I think that's had some very serious consequences. Um, my name is Jack Lawrence. You and I met in Belfast in 1971 when I was a young television correspondent out for CBS. And um, just a couple of anecdotes. Of, this may be the first time I've actually seen Martin when we weren't in a war zone, because uh, although we haven't seen each other... The, the, evening, the evening's not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, although we didn't see each other socially, we, we kept meeting in war zones. And, and, and as someone who was not your competitor or, or your colleague, I, I'd just like to tell a couple of, of, of my favorite Martin Bell stories. Mm. <laughs> they never yes, told me you yes, were coming. Yes, yeah. yes, yes please. Just three days white suit um, that you got wounded in. 1973, eighth or ninth day of the October War, the Yom Kippur War, um, standing, this was after the counterattack by the Israelis, and, and, and I was standing with, with this gentleman, David Green, um, on a ridge line looking toward Damascus, which was 20 miles, 20, 25 miles away. And, and we were about two miles behind the Israeli front line, which were on, a, on another ridge line called Tel Shams. And, and um, we'd been standing there for a couple of hours that morning watching every vehicle that went down the road, down into the valley, and, and across uh, toward Tel Shams, get shelled by the Syrians. Seriously shelled. The, the, uh, there was an OP on Mount Hermon that they still held, and so they could see us and everything. We were just wondering what to do when. Martin pulls up with his camera crew and, 
and gets out as calmly as getting off the number 14 bus on the Brompton Road and, and walks up and, and asks, um, well, are we going down there? And uh, you know, just as casually as, as he would appear on the camera. And, um, and I said, well, no, I don't think it's a good idea because if everything that goes down there gets shelled. And within, as if on cue, within minutes, a busload of journalists international press being escorted by the IDF came along and um, stopped briefly. And we, we said to the escort officer, I wouldn't go down that road if, if I were you. And he took them down down the road anyway. And the bus got, you may recall, halfway to Tel Shams when it too got shelled and then it stopped and they couldn't make up their minds what to do and then eventually they turned around and they came back. And, and that was as far as anybody went of that day. I just remember being so impressed by another correspondent, being so cool and collected, and I didn't know that you'd been an acting sergeant at that time, or had any military experience. <laughs> now, that explains it. The other Martin Bell story I, I, I like to tell people is, I guess it was 20 years later, I was trying to track you down somewhere, and I called the BBC, and they said you were in Berlin. Could I please have your phone number? And, and um, I talked to the foreign editor who, who gave it to me, and I later called you. But just as an afterthought, I said to him, why do you always send Martin to every war the BBC chooses to cover? And he paused a beat, and he said, because he never says no. <laughs> Jack and David, it's lovely to see you again. I've got nothing to say. Uh, is, that, is that the explanation? an inability to say no that's got you in all these messes over the years. Uh, when, I was a kid, when, I, when I was a kid, I had a low boredom threshold, and that's why people go into journalism. I have to say about Jack, Jack, Jack is, a, is, is the best writer I ever met in, in American television news. And one of the reasons that you knew he was good was that he very, rare, very rarely is this understood. The most important gift in television news writing is the art of writing silence. I mean, you knew when to shut up, didn't you? Yeah. And nobody knows it anymore. Yeah. Anyone else before we're heading towards a reasonable conclusion? Yeah. Uh, Mark, as you know, news media has its own agenda. Government foreign policy has its own agenda. That agenda seems to be Afghanistan, Iraq, but probably now China. And I think we're forgetting Africa. Mm -hmm. It's a bit disturbing that we don't understand exactly in countries like Zimbabwe, which is now hitting something like 7,000 pounds inflation. Nobody understands what's happening. Nobody understands what to do about it. My students at Tensile University say that the paras. Good example, but of course it's impossible to think like that. So I think journalists now have to construct an argument how to deal and how to argue for their audience. What do you do about situations like Zimbabwe? Sit back, watch, or actually advocate a policy? What do you do? The Africa, foreign news generally, but Africa in particular has just dropped off the off the news agenda, except occasionally Zimbabwe and, and occasionally Darfur. Um, I know uh, about 10 years ago, the, the Daily, Daily Telegraph had a, what, a serious plan to close all its foreign bureaus because its, uh, it, it, its audience research told the editors that they were the least read papers in the newspaper. Now, a result of, of this is there's a complete sort of hole in our coverage, an Africa-sized hole. And yet, these things are so consequential. We get great tides of refugees washed up on the, on, on, on the shores of Europe. If you just take it from the point of view of, of personal interest, of national interest, uh, Darfur, I think you could argue, is the first war of, of, of climate change uh, as the Sahara races uh, southwards. Um, we try, but I think it's very hard, for instance, to be a, a foreign correspondent for the BBC or anybody else, say, based in Johannesburg or, or anywhere, just, just to get attention on, on, on what you're doing. And when I started, the, 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 the tabloids, or the, the Daily Express was a big shot newspaper in those days. They had people in Africa all the time and their own uh, and their own photographers too. We've fallen into this morass of uh, celebrity journalism, and I think it makes it extremely difficult for, for the people to hold out against 
governments who, who, who take daft decisions because we just don't know enough because we're not well enough informed. Well, there's a very serious point here about the future of serious news coverage in that both newspapers and, and uh, television and indeed radio, uh, the joy of these wonderful blogs and online stuff, now the marketing people can go to the editor and say, look, these are the stories that the audience is interested in. And it's all to do, all, all to do with missing, missing children in Portugal, it's to do with Strictly Come Dancing, and all the serious Darfur not even on the agenda. Is there, is there a problem that's going to be difficult to stand out against? You may disapprove of it, but the, the registered interest of readers and listeners, what they want to know. I think when the going gets serious, then people do turn to, uh, it may be the Economist, it may be the Financial Times, it'll be some, some newspaper which takes foreign news seriously. Uh, the BBC always does well in times of international crisis, but I, I, I mean, I, I do, I, I despair more than most. And when I have the chance of talking to editors in my little program, the most interesting things happen off air. Um, uh, well, they confess, don't they? Well, they confess, which is quite interesting. But example, uh, hours and hours of the Dana inquest uh, coverage. Some viewers didn't like it. I put the question to an editor, "Why did you do so much?" And off, off air. Uh, he said, well, the real reason we did it is every time we put Dana on, the ratings go up. And that's it's kind of sad, really, isn't it? I mean, I, I've reached the point where I refuse to buy an edition of the Evening Standard, which has a, a Maddie headline. I just won't do it, okay. because I know the thing is, is confected. Uh, uh, you've had a good set. Anybody? Yeah, but, but, uh, you, we'll come back to you. But, but first, of, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. This is an open, open society. You can have another go. Listen, I, I, I don't mean to vote my way in, and you may find this extremely hard to believe, but I have, I have two of my brothers that uh, worked for off and on for ten years. In Sudan. I know the uh, southern Sudan is fairly quite well myself, and Leslie Woods had disparate roles and a few roles in actions. Uh, two of my brothers have been working for a Texas oil company that have been uh, uh, supervising, supervising up until that point the drilling of the Ch uh, Chinese wells and the building of the, uh, the oil pipelines in Port Sudan. Okay, now what's very, very interesting, if you take a look at what's really happening out there, is the exploration for oil is already hitting into Chad, and it's also, if you picked up in the newspapers, that's right, you over the last, uh, the last few weeks into northern Uganda and south. Now, the whole game out there is really oil. Right. Right. Thank you, brother. Right. It's about oil. Right. And what staggers me enormously, and I have a couple of friends who work for CBS 60 Minutes, when my two brothers were out there, I, I emailed both of them and said, why don't you get inside? The story, and you're going in with the uh, the the the, the, um, the NGOs and stuff like that. Why don't you go in? These people would give you access straight forward to the military because they have probably more power than anybody else in dealing with the uh, the cartoon military. And you know something? I didn't see one report ever about the the whole oil game that is moving into that part of Eastern right. and Central Africa. Thank you, brother. Martin. No, I, I'll, I'll just leave that as a, as a statement. It's a statement it was, yes. No, it's fine. Yeah. This is a dialogue. It's fine. I, I've just got a quick question, really. And, and I understand the point you made about the internet and, you know, blogging and all that kind of stuff. But part of me thinks that one of the really good things that the internet has done is it's democratised the media in a mm. way that a lot of stories yeah. that wouldn't mm. be touched mm. by, by conventional yeah. media because it's yeah. not a big enough mm. story or mm. it's not a newsworthy enough mm. story or or they've got an, an, another story cropped up, mm. gets covered now in a way that previously people, a lot of people didn't have access yeah. to. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm somebody who was affected by the 2012 Olympics, but they're knocking down my house to make way for the Olympics. Mm. Now, I know that people on the community that I was involved in put stories on the, on the internet yeah. that subsequently were picked up by the media in a way that normally they wouldn't have had access to. Yeah. I actually wonder what your view of that is. I mean, because I, I know yeah. you're, you're not a fan of technology necessarily, but isn't that a good thing? <laughs> Antediluvian as I am, uh, I can see that this empowers people. The rise of the citizen journalist is, is admirable. Um, there are things happening that I absolutely applaud. And occasionally myself, I, I even uh, blog on The Guardian's comment is free. But then I notice what everybody's writing in these blogs. blogs. It's, the, it's the fury of it, the, the venom, the, the ill will. And then I realize what it is, what it is, because it's so quick now. The fingers are working faster than the brain, aren't they? 
Another serious example is uh, coverage, mobile phone internet coverage out of Burma. Uh, yeah. We've got more images yes. and more knowledge yeah. Um, yeah. than ever before yeah. because uh, so many people yeah. have mobile yeah. phones in Burma. Yeah. It is much harder to cover up anymore. Uh, Srebrenica was covered up for, for the massacre for about three months, but it all came out. Burma, you, you it see it immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even, e even old uh, Philistines like me and, and Luddites, we appreciate there's something going on here we should applaud. <laughs> Anyone else want to contribute before we sort of wrap this up and head to the bar? Yeah, sir. I think this gentleman may raised a very serious point, and, and it's a, you mentioned Darfur as one of the serious issues in terms of, what the, in terms of, of Africa being covered. Yeah, you sort of swept over the, the, the response. I was in Sudan in, in, in December. I was captured by the SPLA and I was deported from the country. I'm, in, I'm back in Darfur in three weeks' time. And the points that you raised are very, very valid. And um, looking at the situation of oil, I sit down with some of these members from GM, Justice and Equality, with the mm. factions who are fighting the Janjaweed. And behind closed doors, they will admit that there's no genocides, that the very same off-camera responses that um, you suggest, they, they suggest that, that, that because it, it helps their campaign, it helps them raise funds, it helps bring uh, build attention to the situation from what's happening in Darfur. Is there really a genocide in, in, in Darfur? And why haven't um, journalists, serious journalists, begun to question what's happening? Because he's mentioned a very serious point there. The Chinese have 68% of the oil concessions in Chad. The, the, you have the oil in, in, in southern Darfur. Is this really about the, what, what Darfur has? The world's attention is, is focused on Darfur. There are 26,000 UN peacekeepers there. Four million um, Africans died in the Congo. There was no, um, there was no interest, no media attention in, in that. This is where serious journalism is. Rather than um, tiptoe around it and answer questions about the internet, this is a serious question about journalism. What is happening with with, 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 with mainstream with the mainstream media and, and real journalism in terms of tackling these real issues? As an African, I'm very, very concerned that Africa is all Africans become a backdrop to their own story. Recently, we had 3,000 miners um, caught in some mines in, in South Africa. When, when they came out of the mines, we have a white news reporter who's speaking to the camera about what's happening without even putting the microphone in front of one of, the, one of these 3,000 Africans. Had this been a white person trapped in one of these mines, as we had this individual caught in Thailand or recent, you'd have had a statement from him. I'm very concerned in terms of the way the mainstream media works. And this man has raised a very, very valid point about Darfur, which needs answering with all of these people in this room who seem to be um, from the media and have influence within mainstream media. Another, another try, Mr. Bell? Um, I, I can also speak to the Congo, because I was there last year. I, I, I do things now for UNICEF, and I get the kind of access, which is a, a journalist I would love to have had, and I was very struck that there were, there were no journalists there. I mean, it is one of, the, one of the great, it is the great uncovered story of our time. Uh, however many millions died, they died. Uh, their stories were, were, were untold, especially in the eastern Congo, partly because it's, again, it's the, the, the agenda has, has changed. Uh, the news editors don't think they're going to get any viewers or readers. It's, it's dangerous. Uh, people are unwilling to go there. And you, you have to fly around. And to some extent, it's the, it, it's the same in Darfur. Uh, I think there's a maybe conscious but certainly unconscious racism in our coverage of the wars of the world. And you see it particularly in, the, in those conflicts. So I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Has anybody seen a film called Shooting Gold? which is about the, uh, the massacre in Rwanda. They have a very, very fine scene with a big BBC journalist there when, when they're driving, trying to get out of, uh, of, of, the, of the city. Um, uh, and where she, uh, the, the journalist says, when I was in Kosovo, when I saw them, I could think that was my grandmother, or that's my grandfather, or even my father. But I come to, Af uh, to, to Rwanda, and it's just another African. And I thought that was a very, very apropos way of summing up uh, the, uh, the, the view of a lot of what I've spent a lot of time in Africa. I've yeah, yeah. journalists to uh, travel. Okay. Uh, anyone else who has not had a go and wants to? Well, you had one go, but the uh, second go seems to be for me. Yeah, I'm Just going on from this. Um, I was present at a BBC editorial meeting about three years ago, um, four years ago, when the editor of the Six Top News uh, addressed her team and said that they just had some audience research conducted by BBC One into our news coverage, which revealed that the public were not interested in the Israel-Palestine um, conflict at all. 
not a particular story on a particular day, but as a subject, it did not interest them. And therefore, the controllers of BBC One thought that the six o'clock news on BBC One should not cover this story at all. Uh, now, to do um, the editor credit, she dismissed this out of hand, and we then had a much more useful discussion about how we could cover it in a way that would engage the audience. But it frightened them, I mean, that this audience research could even have been given any credibility at all. That was three or four years ago. Now, um, as the BBC scales down and other organisations go through financial crisis as well, there is a danger of news becoming a commodity. It's exactly as David Sells said, that we get uniform teams who are not doing their own research, who are doing, digging into their own stories and finding things that nobody else knows about. So I wonder, Martin, how you, whether you feel that we are in danger of, of losing more than we gain with the technological change. Um, I, I stopped watching the six o'clock news because it makes me so angry all the time. And, and I've got to avoid being a sort of prophet of doom, even if the doom is actually happening. I mean, I've got, there's enough to be, to, to be angry about in life without watching the six o'clock news. But I think it's very sad that this has happened. And I noticed that the, the news audiences are down, what, 50% on what they were 15 years ago. Um, I think we're, we're hoarding up a whole load of trouble for ourselves in, in because the, the world has never, in my lifetime, well, certainly since the Cuban Missile Crisis, the world has ever been more dangerous than it is now. With, with unprecedented dangers, the, not only uh, 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 global warming, uh, nuclear proliferation, great, great tides of refugees sweeping over the world. Uh, and, and what do we worry about? We worry about Britney Spears. You know. Martin, to what do you attribute this retreat from seriousness? Is it, is it there some, an adjunct of the consumer society? Uh, it's funny, there are a whole lot of kids coming on who are, who are not apathetic. I talked to uh, universities, I was at one last night, but they, they, they're interested in, 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 in climate change issues and environmental issues. But there are, there are lots of people of, of, of all ages who are really only interested in the England rugby football team or the celebrity nonsense of the moment, and I don't understand yeah. it. Over here. Oh, no, it's great Hold on, hold on, we'll get your camera. Camera. Yeah, microphone. Yeah. Well, I think when the BBC showed Vaughan's 16 minutes of what's really going on in Helmand, it was absolutely riveting. And even if you had no preconceived notions about Afghanistan, it would, it would, it would hold you. Yes, so to some extent, I mean, the BBC, if the BBC can't be serious, who, who can be serious? And, uh, I, I think it's too, it's too early to give up. On that optimistic note, we're nearly, we're nearly done, but, I, but, but just one final thing. If I've got my arithmetic right, you will be celebrating your 70th birthday on the 31st of August next year. How are you going to celebrate it, and how are you going to spend the rest of your lifespan allotted to you? I sure hope I'll be doing the best job I've ever had, which is working for UNICEF. I'm just completing this report, which even at my vast age, which should be on Newsnight, is a compliment to Vaughan's about next Wednesday night. And I'm, for the first time in my life, I'm a paid employee of the United Nations. I'm being paid one dollar for it. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, thank you very much.